Now let's move on and talk about simulations. Simulations can be broken into two different categories. First, they teach about something, or second, they teach how to do something. Then each of those categories can be broken down into even smaller subgroups. Teaching about something can be broken into physical simulations or iterative simulations. And teaching how to do something can be broken into procedural simulations or situational simulations. Let's talk about simulations that teach about something. The first type of simulation is a physical simulation. In physical simulations, students are able to manipulate the objects on the screen. An example of this could be a program that would simulate combining baking soda and vinegar. The student would be able to use the mouse to manipulate the ingredients on the scre screen and combine them, and then they would be able to see the reaction. Another type of simulation that teaches about something is an iterative simulation. This is a simulation that simulates a process that is normally either too slow or too quick, and it can speed them up or slow them down in order for a student to be able to experience and see that process. An example of this could be a simulation of the rock cycle. Often it takes thousands of years in nature for the rock cycle to take place. Using an iterative simulation, it could speed up that process, allowing the student to see the entire cycle in one sitting. Another example of this could be the decaying of an animal or the process of uh, mitosis. All of these are things that could be slowed up or sped down so that a student could get an in-depth understanding of how that process works. The next type of simulations are simulations that teach how to do something. These simulations are grouped as procedural or situational. Procedural simulations teach the necessary steps to be able to perform certain procedures. These are things like how would you wire a house for an electrician while they are in training so that they don't actually have to touch the wires and possibly hurt themselves or someone else or a mechanic being walked through the process of taking apart a motor and putting it back together again. These would be procedural simulations. There's a routine and a step, and it all teaches them how to do a certain procedure. Situational simulations are when they are put into a scenario and they are asked to make decisions and react. This could be things like putting them in a desert and asking them to create a city. They would have to make decisions and have to use their knowledge of what a city needs to be able to build that city. They're having to make decisions and react to the various scenarios. For me, finding the relative advantage of simulations is the easiest of all of them. These are situations where students are going to be allowed to experience something that they would not normally be able to due to monetary or physical restraints. We're probably not going to be able to fly our entire students from class of students from Idaho to the rainforest in Brazil. However, we can give them a simulation and give, let them experience that using software. These are also highly engaging for students. They want to learn about these new things and they're being given situations where they can experience that in ways they never could just sitting and listening to a teacher. These simulations often encourage higher levels of critical thinking and problem solving skills. And they also allow students to experience complex experiments and processes that you would not normally be able to do in the classroom. Some example of simulation software is Starry Night. This is software that is astronomical in concepts. They present a night sky to students and talks about different astronomical events that students would not normally be able to experience. Layered Earth is also another science-related simulation. It simulates the Earth science processes, such as the rock cycle, the continental drift. Oregon Trail simulates the journey of early pioneers as they cross the United States. All of these are situations that a student would not be able to hands-on experience. They need simulation to make that possible. The next category we want to talk about is educational games. Educational games simply combine learning with gaming and entertainment. Recently, in a study conducted by Business Week, the 
They found that the normal student, the average child, spends eight hours a day playing video games. Educational games is an attempt by software companies to bridge this gaming and entertainment with learning. The games are different from drill and practice in that they include an element of competition as well as game rule play, whereas drill and practice simply is practicing skills. Relative advantage of educational games is that they are highly engaging. They require little direction from the teacher if it's a good quality game. It gives students a break from the normal school day routine. And it's presented in a format that is very familiar to most students. Most of our students know how to use those gaming software. There's lots of examples of educational games out there. I've given you a couple of different companies that create lots and lots and lots of software. Uh, my suggestion is that you Google and Google educational software and you will get thousands of examples. But these are some companies that are proven and that have been around for a long time. One of them is Knowledge Adventure. This is the company that created Reading Blaster and Math Blaster. Also the Learning Company. They created Reader Rabbit and Reader Math. Also, they did Where in the World is Common San Diego and the Oregon Trail. So the last thing that we're going to talk about is types of problem-solving software. We want to get into these problem-solving ones. There's two types of the problem-solving software. First is content area specific. These problems are going to be focused on whatever the content area is. If you're a math teacher, it's content it is focused on math. If you're a language teacher, these problem-solving skills are going to be focused in language. The second area is content-free problem-solving skills. This software focuses on general problem-solving skills that can be applied across the curriculum. The, rel the relative advantage of problem-solving software is that it helps students visualize the process of problem-solving in a unique environment. They can be highly engaging to students as they receive feedback and work through complex problems successfully. On their, these problems are done on their own, so they are not overshadowed by other students' correct answers. We all know in the classroom when we're teaching, we have those kids who never raise their hand and try to answer because the kids who have the correct answer are already shouting out the answer. In using this software, those students who would not normally get a chance to work their way through a problem can do so without being overshadowed and interrupted by those other students. Some thoughts on the problem solving software. You need to make sure that your students have all the prerequisite skills they need to be successful in the software program. If we put them loose on that software and they don't know how to do the prerequisite skills, they will become frustrated and it will no longer be effective in our classroom. Some examples of problem-solving software is a game called Crazy Machines and Wacky Contraptions. Also, if you go to the web page with this link right here, you will see a list of problem-solving software that has been evaluated. If you scroll to the bottom of the page, it will actually rate them according to their educational value and how fun it is for the kids. This is an excellent research resource for a teacher who is looking for problem-solving software to use in their classroom. Now, with all these different types of educational software out there, it's a little bit confusing and hard to decide what you're going to use in your classroom. These are some questions that I can suggest that you consider before buying any software. First, how will it be used in your classroom? Depending on how you're going to use it is going to really shape how you're going, what software you're going to buy. Are they going to be doing it on their own? Are they going to be using small groups? Is it going to be taking the place of the teacher? And these are all things that you need to decide before you start looking at software. The second is, does it scaffold for students who may need more assistance? You know, we all know those students who sometimes need a little bit more help than others. Does the software provide scaffolding for those students so that if you are not available to help them, they will be able to get the help they need? Is it research-based or is it something that's just been put together? Does it have an appealing format that will engage students? Is there instructional value and is it student-friendly? All of these things need to be considered when looking at software. 
Also to help you to evaluate what kind of software you want to choose is an article called from Technology Today. This article gives you some great tips and insights as to things that you should be thinking about when buying the software. Another one is a software evaluation web quest. This does take a little bit of time, but if you have time and you want to learn how to really evaluate software on your own, I highly recommend this web quest. Also available is an evaluation form. If you scroll to the bottom of this link, you will see a form that you can actually print. We've been given permission to use it to evaluate any of the software on your own. I appreciate that you've sat with me through this presentation. I hope that you've learned a little bit more about instructional software and the advantages that it could have in your class. I have some references that I want to make sure that I mention. Much of the information that I have given you today comes from Roblair and Doring's Integrating Technology into Teaching. This is an excellent resource for any teacher who is wanting to integrate technology into their classroom. It has lots of information that is really good and really up to date. As you can see, they've recently redone it with the copyright of 2013.